I really am pleased to be able to offer this, uh, that we can bring some experts to offer this uh, panel discussion to you today because I am fully aware of the increased volume of students who are veterans that we're seeing on our campuses and, and I, I think from hearing from my Nakata colleagues that there are uh, many of you experience this throughout the country. Um, so we, this is a very timely topic and we are so blessed today to have uh, presenters with us who have expertise in this uh, area of advising, but also, you know, as some of them are veterans and some of them are married to veterans, so various amounts of experience. Um, each one of the panelists will tell you a little bit more about uh, their knowledge and experience working with veterans as they uh, begin to give their first part of the presentation. So our first uh, panelist today that I'd like to invite to give us some information about who these students are, uh, what do we know about our veteran students, is Jill Geisler-Wheeler, who is Assistant Director of the Fulbright College Honors Program at the University of Arkansas. So she's going to get us started, and, and then we'll um, hear from the other panelists as well. Jill. Thank you, Terry. Yes, my name is Jill, and as you can tell, I am the individual who's married to someone in the military. I started dating my husband back in 2004, and upon learning he was a member of the Arkansas National Guard, I immediately got a little nervous, but he assured me that his MOS was field artillery, and they hadn't used that in 15 years since the Gulf War. But promptly, seven months later, while doing some training in Oklahoma, he did get activated. I was able to plan our wedding within a week. He came back in a month and got a month with me before his first deployment. He was gone with training in the country and out for 16 months. And upon returning, was here for another 10 months before deployed again for another 14 month stint. When he returned, he went back to work at Walmart and started referring all of the National Guard individuals that were in college to me for academic advising. So that's how I got started, and I haven't looked back since then. Today we're going to speak to the different areas that each one of us has experience in when working with our student veterans. But I think before we go any further, it's really important for us to know who these veterans are and what better place to start than why they joined. On the screen right now, you can see Andy. He's a student veteran at the University of Arkansas, and he's pictured here with his grandfather, who is also a veteran. Andy chose to join the United States Army in spring break of his senior year in high school. And the reasons that he chose to join are listed here. Still others joined for different reasons, like the ones listed on this next slide. And, of course, family tradition and, and things along that nature are always um, a strong motivating factor. But then also, uh, we've had students that are here that have joined to get out of trouble because they were hanging around with the wrong crew. So there was lots of different ways and, and reasons why students will join their particular branch of the military. So now that we know some of these reasons, it's important to also know about the two main forms of service. You have the active duty. Um, and the reserve component or the National Guard component. The active duty can be looked at as full-time military. So seven days a week, um, you know, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So all time, all military. And then you have the reserve component um, that also includes the National Guard. So you may have heard them referred to as part-time military. One week in a month, two weeks a year, that type of training. This has been the case um, in, in the past, but in these current conflicts that we're going to talk about today, the Reserve and National Guard component has vastly increased. We can potentially work with students from any forms of conflict. Student veterans can be from a vast array of different wars and conflicts. But the majority of our students who are coming to campuses right now are probably going to be in our post 9-11 student veteran population. So they could have participated in one or more of the conflicts that you see listed here. The post 9-11 student veteran has experiences that make their deployments very different from the pre-9-11 student veterans. Some of them listed here are longer, more frequent deployments. You have um, a large percentage, again, of National Guard and Reserve, like I had said earlier. And also, students and, and veterans that are coming back to us with injuries um, and surviving injuries that maybe they wouldn't have in previous conflicts. And that's just to name a few. 
The deployments consist of three phases, and we'll look at those here. So we have the pre-deployment phase, deployment, and then also the returning. And we'll start off with the pre-deployment phase. Um, it can be seen as being physically present but psychologically absent. You can imagine how a service member's mind is on so many different things about planning what's going to happen with their life. The military's role in preparation is fairly limited. They will require an emergency contact to be given, and they'll also put together um, a pretty basic power of attorney for the servicemen and women. They are generally required to do the rest of the planning themselves. Hopefully there will be a family readiness group or an FRG that is local and that can help with family and loved ones in this transition. But probably last on their mind is our institutions and, and what they need to do with us. One thing they definitely need to do is let us know that they're being deployed. At that point, as academic advisors and, and individuals that work with these students, we can talk to them about the the possible steps they need to take. Do they need to go ahead and withdraw? Are they able to continue out this semester and, and finish out, or, or would it be better to go ahead and take a step back? There are a lot of uncertainty during this time, so there will these uncertainties can actually impact their academic performance. The length and start date of a deployment can shift many times before the actual training starts. The shift in expectations of being devoted to their loved ones, their friends, and their family, and then changing that to their unit and to the deployment and to the mission. And no matter how we plan and how prepared someone is, there's never enough time to get everything done that you would like to, and saying goodbye to those friends and family members that you're going to be leaving. I'm a visual learner, so I'm going to use a lot of photos in this next section just to talk to you about what our student veterans could be experiencing while they are deployed and in country. In this first, this is going to talk about the, their home away from home. So you can see the top left-hand corner, that's my husband's bunk when he was in Iraq. Um, he's got two SEC teams located there, and as you know, I'm from the University of Arkansas, so I, I fully believe that's the best one there. But as an Alabama grad, he had to represent there as well. You also see that students could be in tents, um, like the tent in Camp Victory there. Connex boxes are basically like shipping containers with electricity, and even old chow halls and mud huts. So lots of different living conditions, very different from probably what they would experience back here in the States. During deployment, there are other challenges that they are experiencing. They can include operational and cognitive challenges that um, we discussed earlier about the living conditions and you know, kind of you're able to see that. But then also, we're having a lot of um, individuals that are dealing with emotional and spiritual issues, um, fear, fear of failure for the deployment, guilt for what they have left, and changes in faith would just be a few of those. My husband is also listed here, or seen here in the top right corner. He was able to be fishing, so when he got bored, he would fish. He did not eat any of the fish, but that was something that he could do to keep his time. <laughs> Upon ending their deployment, our servicemen and women, the challenges don't really necessarily go away. There are now new challenges that they have to deal with, like traffic, crowds, being unarmed for the first time in many months, difficulty relating to friends and family. So they have missed these individuals for their whole entire deployment, but now the individuals they miss the most are their buddies and their unit members who experienced the same things that they did. And oftentimes they question what they're doing now that their uniform is removed and they don't have orders to follow, what is it that they should be doing? It's clear that while deployed, our veterans have different ways of thinking and acting that have been able to keep them alive and to keep them very safe during their deployments. And here is, on this slide, is a list of different ways of things that were very helpful while during deployment that can become more problematic when they re return home. Everyday tasks like driving, going to the store, or even being in a classroom with only one visible exit can cause a lot of fear and anxiety and frustration for our servicemen and women. Andy talked about a sense of vulnerability when he returned that he didn't really expect. He didn't expect to be constantly checking for his weapon and the rifle that he had carried the whole time he was deployed. He didn't expect to have 
questions about faith, but up, upon deployment, one of his unit members did commit suicide. And so what is he going to, you know, what does he believe and what is right? And then he also, like I said earlier, didn't really know what to do once he didn't have orders to follow unconditionally. He was a little left adrift as far as what would the next step would be. I also want to show you real quickly the vast differences in the percentage of the American population that has been involved in different conflicts over the years um, and compare that to the post 9-11 population. So we can see that it was close to 9% of the population that had some involvement in World War II and now those individuals came back with much more support and a country that understood a little bit more than many of our student veterans are having when they return from um, their deployments. Today's post 9-11 student veteran make up just around 1% of the total U.S. population. Now that we see who this population is and why they have joined, I think it's important to talk about what they need once they get back to us on campuses. Absolutely, Jill, and thank you for uh, giving us a great introduction to who these students are. It's, as advisors, I think it's important that we know where they're coming from and, and some of the experiences they've had that will be unique to this population. So our next panelist will be Kent Seaver, and uh, Kent is the Director of Learning Services of North Lake College, and in case you're like me and don't know where that is, I had to Google it. It's in Irving, Texas, and Kent is going to uh, share with us information about what our our veteran students might be experiencing as they decide to come to college and as they enter our campuses. Kent. Thank you, Terry. Basically, I started working with student veterans in active military about 16 years ago when I would administer CLEP and distance learning exams, primarily for those men and women stationed at the Naval Air Station over in Fort Worth, Texas, which is just down the road from us. I discovered then that the skill set that those men and women possess oftentimes goes beyond the classroom and what we call textbook knowledge. The first slide that you're seeing has to do when student veterans make decisions about going to school. When any student veteran makes the decision to come, or in some cases return to school, one of the first questions that they're going to ask is how much is this going to cost? Fortunately, most of our service men and women are eligible for the various types of benefits, both from federal as well as state programs. For example, Chapter 33, probably the most applied type of, be of benefit by our student veterans, can cover virtually all costs associated with going to college, even housing if it's necessary. Other benefit chapters include Chapter 30, which consists of Montgomery GI Bill vets who served on active duty prior to 9-11, sometimes, sometimes called the old school or old GI Bill. Another one that we're seeing a lot of now, at least at the community college rank, is Chapter 31. It's also known as the Vocational Rehabilitation and Employment Program. Its mission is to help veterans with service-connected disabilities prepare for, find, and even keep suitable jobs after college. Like any student, the student veteran should have a list of items they need or find important when they're pursuing their education. Because of the skill set and issues already addressed, it's important for student veterans to see if the school has veteran support or, in some cases, veteran outreach. One such outreach is the in-house veteran centers, many of which are standalone, one-stop shops separate from your already existing advising offices. One final thought on this slide is that people, students, and especially veterans need to do their own research. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. Some, quote, for-profit colleges offer solid programs, but especially student veterans have to weigh that cost involved with what might be the return on that investment. If you are a student veteran or you've ever worked with one, you know about the DD-214. It is basically your career summary, who you are, what you did in the military, and for how long you did it. It is the starting point for every veteran attending college. After that, documenting your prior learning can be done several different ways, but the American Council on Education has an established system called the ACE system that a lot of colleges will use in place of adopting their own and starting from scratch. It's one of the best because it's recognized 
but it's also one of the easiest because it already exists. I guess the best answer as to what prior learning is, in my opinion, is found right here in this particular statement from, from the uh, University of Georgia. I like this because it takes into account the knowledge that the student possesses, the student veteran in specific, but also how that knowledge relates to college courses. It connects the dots for the students and allows their experience and knowledge to be validated in terms of educational use. This next particular slide basically addresses the four most common areas of prior learning, and it's assessed in four basic ways. You see the first, the military coursework, is simply that. It's a comparison of a course or training one took in the military with something offered at the collegiate level. Basically, it's a comparison and a contrast. This document is, most, is the most common one used to show these comparisons, a joint military transcript. As you can see, it details the specifics of the course, not just for the military, but also for the college equivalent. So again, you can see what's included and also what's not included. Aside from the course specifics, military coursework and experience can easily be translated into specific degree plans or even career fields. One great example of this is seen here, courtesy of military.com. If you trained or had experience in a health-related field like allergy clinician, there are at least six areas of study to the student vet available in a college where prior learning can be applied. That's six specific degree fields that they can move into, if necessary, with their already established prior learning. The next particular slide deals specifically with the portfolio. Now, on purpose, I'm not going to spend a lot of, a lot of time on this but I will go ahead and explain it in these specific areas. They're popular among stu some student veterans, especially those entering four-year institutions, but they're probably also the most subjective because they rely a great deal on the student's narrative as well as evidence. Basically, the student has to write, has to justify why they need the credit. Instead of a test score that you can see or a grade that you can see that you've earned, the student vet essentially lobbies a college for credit based upon what they experienced in the military. From my own personal experience here at North Lake and at Tarrant County College over the last 16 years, the most common way to illustrate prior learning is via the college level exam program, also known as CLEP. For almost 50 years, all types of students, including military, have used CLEP exams to illustrate prior learning and therefore attain college credit and also avoid unnecessary college classes, expenses, and frankly saving them a lot of time. There are specifically 33 CLEP exams, but there, as you can see, they're broken down into five specific subject areas. And the exams themselves range from essay to multiple choice. Most exams are timed to last 90 minutes, and just about all provide a score at the end of the exam with the exception being the English composition, which of course has to be graded. This is very, very good for student vets needing to enroll quickly or determine what step is next. They get their score, they go enroll, or they go see an advisor, and immediately they know where they stand in terms of the credit that they've earned. Ken, thank you. Uh, those are some very good specific examples of things that our student veterans will be bringing to us as they enter into our um, colleges and universities and we really need to try to help provide a, a smooth transition for them so very helpful I want to go back to Jill and, and ask you Jill if you could share with us some more information about you know why is it important that we have veterans on our campuses what do they bring to to our culture and our and our campus that is a great question, Terry. I'm, I think we all know that student veterans do bring so much to our campus and our classrooms, and sometimes it's part of our job as their first contact or their academic advisor to remind them of the strengths that they do have. They have many strengths and characteristics that our traditional 18 to 24 age student population may not. We have a lot of those listed right there. 
Once they return, they're no longer wearing their uniform. And if they do not disclose that they are a student veteran, it can be very difficult for us to be able to give them the services that they need. And this does pose um, very specific challenges for us. Advisors are often the first impression that a student veteran will have on campus once they have been admitted. And we're also keepers of a vast amount of knowledge. In the military, service members have what's called points of contact, or POCs. And while we're not always the correct person that our student veterans need to get in touch with for specific issues that they're having, it's important that we have our own POCs that we can pass along to our students in our meetings. A list of POCs can be likened to the best phone book ever. You will have a list of information of the individual's name, what it is, their phone number, and then what it is that they can do for the student veteran. And as advisors, these are the people that we need to know in order to best assist our student veterans. Names and relationships really do make a difference when working with our student veterans. If a student veteran has a good relationship with me as an advisor and a trusting relationship, and I tell them to go to see John in Hunt Hall, and he will take care of your credits being transferred, that is going to have so kind of carry so much more weight than if I just tell him, go to the registrar's office and get everything taken care of. So having that relationship and even saying something like, go see John, my friend, or my friend John, so that they know that this individual has worked with me before when I'm working with student veterans, and they automatically have that trust there. For us, POCs can be as easy to establish as a new Excel spreadsheet. We all have plenty of those laying around. And while we don't have a lot of time, taking that extra time is really going to make all the difference when you're working with these servicemen and women on returning. Some examples of individuals on your campus that you might want to reach out to, if you have a veteran service center, they would be a great place to start for sure. Um, a VA certifying official, who is going to make sure that they receive their funding each semester would be a good person to get to know. Someone in the registrar's office that could evaluate prior credit like Kent was talking about. The tutoring center, um, Center for Disabilities, and also a writing center, you know, those could just be some great places to start. And your POC could be many, many, many more people than that. We are extremely busy, but like I said, having those connections will make a difference in the transition from boots to books for our servicemen and women. We should also take the time to walk our student veteran through different things, that extra step, so actual course registration. Instead of just handing them a sheet of paper that says, this is how you use on the University of Arkansas campus, we call it ISIS, it's a people soft system. Here's how you use it, go do it. Walk them through adding that very first class so that they know exactly the steps that need to be happening. Explain the difference between dropping a course and withdrawing from a semester. This can make a big difference on the funding that they receive if they're going to have to pay anything back um, because they did have to drop a course or they did have to withdraw. The deployment status versus registration status. There are times when our servicemen and women return home, but they are still not free to go about living um, their lives. They're not released completely. And those individuals, were they to enroll at a university or a college, could not receive the benefits because they have not been released from their deployment. So understanding that. And some campuses require freshmen to live on the, the campus their first year. This could be a problem and knowing who to contact in order to make sure that these individuals would not could get a waiver from that or would not have to do that. And as Kent discussed, understanding how their previous training can prepare them um, with either credits or also giving them an idea of what they're going to do next and maybe what their major may be once they're here. While everything we do is very important when dealing with student veterans, maybe one of the biggest things and the most important is making sure they receive their funding. So every semester, a student using the GI Bill or any form of military supplemental payment for their school has to have an approval from an advisor that says if the student takes this class this semester, after so many semesters and so many hours, they will receive a degree. So these are all going towards a degree. For a lot of students, taking general electives is fine, and even for our student veterans. But understanding that at some point, 
those classes have to be working towards their degree. And just taking electives for elective's sake could end up causing the servicemen and women to have to repay that money, and it may not be money that they have available. Many times, the money they're receiving from their funding is the only way they're paying for school, and oftentimes living on that money as well. While most of us have likely moved away from paper files, when dealing with our student veterans and keeping up with this information, sometimes that might be the best option for you. I like to do that because I'm able to streamline the process for me. I can check off a check sheet one semester, and then the next semester go back and just fill in the newest semester's work. This also can work as a visual reminder for the students to let them know exactly what they have left and if electives will, in fact, fit in with their information. The University of Arkansas has developed an online system that went into effect this year. And it's an approval form that before they went into all of this, we had the VA certifying official come and train each person who was going to be a approver for each college on our campus. They also were able to let us know just how important these are and to reiterate to that to advisors that this is the way the students are receiving their funding. What's so great about this form is that the students fill this form out on their own, so it puts ownership back to them. They fill out the form, and upon submitting it, it goes directly to the approving official. So when I get an email, I can go through, check out everything, make sure the student is enrolled in courses that they are supposed to be, and upon approval, I am required to upload the document that I checked off. So I'm required to upload that check sheet. If I do reject it, so let's say the student has not declared their major yet, and it's a very simple process to declare, but that has to be declared in order for those classes to count, I can hit the reject button and leave notes for the student so they know what needs to change in order for them to resubmit. This allows students not to have to take the valuable um, time out of their day to come to an appointment, then to have to leave, to carry papers all around campus, so it makes the process easier for them as well. And if your campus hasn't started working to become a veteran-friendly campus, on the screen right now are the 19 recommendations that the University of Arkansas Task Force came up with. And while it's not the only thing that we are doing or the only thing that we should be doing in order to become a more veteran-friendly campus, these were a great place for us to start, and it's really worked out well for us. Thank you, Jill. Well, I really appreciate the very specific examples and ideas. I think everybody's going to be able to take away something from this presentation that they can uh, begin to use on their campuses. At Penn State, I'm kind of you know a little proud, at least, of the fact that we just changed our registration procedures to give veterans priority registration. So they now register at the same time as our student athletes and as our honors uh, students. So it's we're we're doing little taking baby steps maybe, but trying to make uh, some the campus a little bit uh, veteran friendly for them. Uh, so now we're going uh, to change the topic just a little bit. We are seeing a phenomenon uh, around the country of veteran students being more interested in online and distance learning opportunities, even while they're still uh, deployed in, in, and on active military duty, uh, they are able to take advantage of some of the programs that we offer at our institutions. So uh, we've invited George Trevino and Terry Watson uh, to join us from Penn State's World Campus. Uh, be, these two are our, the tag team so to speak, for the World Campus uh, for working with veteran students. And they've got a lot of experience, and they've worked through some policies and procedures for making it easier for the veterans to uh, get involved in, the, in online education. So uh, Terry's going to get us started, right? Uh, hey, Terry, this is no, George. No, it's George. Actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's OK. It's OK. Um, Yes, uh, my name is George Trevino. I'm, the ac I'm an academic advisor for uh, uh, Penn State World Campus. Uh, and I'm also a retired US Navy chief of over 24 years. And uh, in fact, during that time, uh, I also worked as an educational officer for well over eight years. Uh, I am a veteran of OIF, OEF, and a bunch of other ones. Uh, but most importantly, I'm also a disabled vet. Um, so. You know, this slide, uh, veterans have 
a certain perception of college. And when they start their education, uh, they soon realize that the college culture is uh, very different. Uh, this statement is basically only one reason why uh, several of them are beginning to choose an online uh, post-secondary education. So uh, there are many different types of veterans, um, you know, active duty, military statuses. There, there, there's a bunch of them. And I think the key note is here is that they should not be placed into uh, one demographic group. Veterans do respond better to the peers who can um, better relate to their culture. Uh, veterans, I have to tell you, are adult learners and are not typically freshmen uh, in their mindset. Uh, so when, when dealing with them, especially on over the phone, because you know we don't see them face to face on an online environment, uh, they really appreciate the directness uh, that can be given to them, so they can better evaluate uh, their situation, uh, you know, a academically. Okay, many veterans actually do not know what resources are out there to assist them uh, with their challenges. In fact, it goes against their culture to disclose uh, that they even have disabilities uh, because they do not want to be labeled as unfit for duty or um, worst, removed from the unit. Or they have what I call the Black Knight Syndrome, which I'll explain in a minute, and deny that they have the disabilities because it, it basically is a sign of weakness. Uh, they are trained to carry out smartly, even when wounds, uh, even when they have a lot of wounds, uh, to complete their missions. Uh, some, like me, deny that we even have disabilities, and many feel uh, that they can come overcome just about any challenge. So, um, the Black Knight. Yes, the picture here is from the Mighty Python and the Holy Grail. Um, in the picture, the Black Knight just keeps fighting, uh, you know, King Arthur until King Arthur cuts every limb off that he's got. And as, as King Arthur is leaving, the knight says, uh, come back, you coward. Um, well, it, it is a very funny um, segment of that movie, but it's based on some concepts of the warrior's mindset. And you have to kind of keep in mind that uh, the warriors don't really admit, meet, uh, they don't like Im admitting that they're defeated. In fact, they just want to keep, um, keep going even when the odds are stacked against them. So something to remember. Okay, some some veterans do feel that it that if they take online courses, uh, they avoid dealing with uh, people. Uh, they they don't understand or they just don't want to uh, be in an environment that they don't feel comfortable in. Um, veteran online students with disabilities or VOSDs feel that the online programs are accessible. When they realize that they have problems, uh, they use their can-do spirit to try and solve the problems they encounter in the courses, and uh, you know, just as they were trained. However, the reality is is that uh, they, they're really out of their element, and uh, you know, they by the time they really start to seek uh, any kind of assistance, it may be too late, and then they really uh, get themselves in trouble, and become students uh, at risk. So what we use here at Penn State is uh, we use triggers to, do, to direct the VOSDs to uh, another veteran who coaches them and directs them to the resources that have proven very successful here. Uh, I'm one of those coaches. Uh, the veteran coach uh, then explains to the VOSD that they are actually in a new env environment, and uh, I actually guide them uh, to the person who can, can assist them in possibly trying to figure out what, if anything, they, they need. Um, when I coach them, I mention that Terry will actually contact them. Um, I don't actually hand out the phone, a phone number. I know that some people do, but if you hand out a phone number, probably like me, they'll jot it down and then throw it away. So, because I couldn't remember what the phone number was for. So we actually have Terry contact them. Um, and I. Okay, well, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties, uh, George. We can't hear you. Um, and it looks like there's a freezing issue maybe going on. So um, what I'm going to do is see if Terry Watson is uh, able to come in and uh, 
Terry, if you could just uh, take us into the discussion that you have about, you know, I know that George works with the students to coach them right. about uh, what they need to disclose about themselves being a veteran and what their issues are, and that they're going to be working with someone like you who is not a veteran and and how that works, how that trade off, of it, how you tag team, and I think that's so interesting. Yeah, it, and how you do that. You know, I'm, I'm getting really excited because I see a lot of questions about disclosure, and that's exactly what George and I uh, really work on. Um, and again, um, what George was saying before he got disconnected there was that when he coaches a veteran to me, he does the, he lets them know that this is a new culture you're walking into. So Terry, one is not a veteran, so he doesn't understand some of the terminology and some of the culture that uh, that we understand. Oh, he's back. All right, George is back. Um, how, how is my audio? Can I? Can you, can you hear me, George? Yes. Oh, okay, good. So. Um, one of the things that he does, he tells them, one, Terry is not a veteran. However, he has resources that's available uh, to help you uh, achieve your academic goals. Um, and a little, a little bit about myself, too. Um, I, um, I work uh, at Penn State World Campus. I'm the disability contact liaison, which means I, I work with the students with disabilities to receive uh, academic adjustments and uh, equal uh, educational um, access. Um, and one of the things that happened about two years ago is um, I, I, I saw that 15 veterans were referred to me uh, for having a disability. However, when they, when they talked to me, they never actually disclosed what a disability was. Um, are you hearing how many sound? Yeah, Terry. Yeah, I think we're going to have switch, George and switch your headphones. That's the advantage of them being in the same room is that they can share the equipment and hopefully the George's right. headset will be working now. Can you hear me? There you are, All good. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, this works out this well then. Okay, so another part about that is and I'm gonna sort of go back, I'll go for it. Um when you're looking at um I, I work you know, I work with the veterans I work with veterans as well, but those 15 veterans that were referred to me, they did, they did not disclose their disability at all. And actually, uh, it, it became more of a Q&A as what can you provide for me? Um, and without me knowing their functional limitations, I really couldn't give them any answers. So I think it's really important to take a look at ADA and to sort of understand why that was happening. Um, now, at Rural Campus, again, we work with, uh, with, with adult learners. And so a lot of our students are uh, older than your traditional 18, 19 year olds, and that's also including our veterans. And why that that's important for veterans? Um, if you're thinking about ADA historically, a ADA started back in 1918 uh, with uh, the Smith Says Veteran Rehab Act. So it actually started with veterans, but as time went on, uh, the uh, ADA and also with uh, ADA and academics sort of with, went, went away from veterans. So we sort of try to bring that back. Um, but the most important part about that is, is that a lot of our students are born prior to ADA um, as we know it today. So our students went through uh, grade school, high school, without, without actually having that implemented into the programs. Um, so it's really important for institutions to figure out how can we educate our students about their accommodations, about disability services, about those resources, because unlike our traditional students that are coming in right now, they did not have that, uh, that information uh, uh, available to them when they were in school. Um, and then if you look at those numbers there, uh, our veteran students that we see are actually, uh, the percentage is actually even higher than our um, non-veteran students when uh, looking at the, um, the, the age demographics for our uh, World Campus students. The biggest part about uh, World Campus, again, is online, is the online, ins online platform. And so when people think of the online institution, they think about online plus the institution equals educational uh, accessibility. But actually, um, you're taking that, uh, you, you look at it closer, it's actually just being available. So you're making education available to students that otherwise wouldn't have it. For it to be accessible, it takes a team to make that happen. And so when I'm talking to a lot of my veterans, I hear a lot about um, the reason why they chose the online environment because of the flexibility, um, the institutional commitment. Um, again, they don't, you know, if they have to move or they get deployed, they don't have to worry about, you know, dropping the school because they have to move locations, they can take that with them. Uh, the other part about that too is the easy in transition. Um, we see that quite a lot. We see that with uh, 
uh, students who are with PTSD who are who had uh, issues with being inside a classroom. Um, so by being online, being in their own environment, uh, they don't they they the perception they don't have to worry about that. But there's a lot of misconceptions about what online access actually is. And what happens is when a veteran talks to me, that's that's being coached over to me, typically by George, most, uh, I get the opportunity to explain to them exactly what equal access is. And when I do that, it becomes a, it's sort of introducing them to a new culture. So saying to them, you know, by by being a student here at this institution, your rights as a student to get equal access is like anyone else here. But this is how the process goes. So here at Penn State, we sort of started the VOSD initiative, which stands for Veteran Online Students with Disabilities. Uh, we got tired of saying that over and over again, so we just called it VOSD. Um, but what we really focus on is trying to make sure that those particular students have the opportunity to at least have the conversation about disability services. Since we've done that, the numbers have really skyrocketed, and I'll, and I'll show you that in a future slide. So again, it's really important also to let students know that ADA also exists online. Just looking at the veterans that came across my path, um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, veterans with vision and hearing impairments, uh, as well as TBI and other uh, cognitive functional limitations. But uh, with our students with, uh, who have hearing and vision impairments, there are specific accommodations that requires a team uh, to make their work accessible. So it's really important that we make that known that ADA also exists in this platform too. Looking at some of the numbers, um, after we started our um, VOSD initiative, uh, we really saw the numbers increase uh, a lot. We actually went from three students to 61 students, again, veteran students, just in a short period of time, just by changing our process. And again, that's going back to uh, George coaching them over, letting them, know, letting them know that he's not a veteran, he's going to ask these questions. So the bear of him, humor him. If he doesn't know what med board is, don't get upset. Again, he, he hasn't been through what George calls the boot camp. Um, <laughs> so um, I think it's really important. So what what happens here is with the um, for my stand. Okay, I'll keep going now. So when veteran, what what we got from having veterans be a part of disability services, two key programs came out of that. Uh, one of them was the syllabi workshop, really. That um, one was the syllabi workshop, really, which helps veterans with TBI and memory loss to keep track of their academics and their um, their their um, syllabi. The other one is the um, category of disclosures. When we were looking at the culture of non-disclosure, and this goes back to how do we get students to disclose their disability? It's even more difficult when you're looking at veterans who are coming from a um, culture of non-disclosure. Um, so we really want to focus on being able to figure out what are those barriers that your current institution are presenting to set, up, to set barriers for them disclosing. And that could be many things. It could be not having veteran, a veteran staff. It could be not, um, not being veteran friendly, and so on and so on. Can someone go to the next slide for me since I don't have uh, George? Can you go to the next slide for me? There you go, thank you. All right, so just to give you an idea of uh, what we've done at Penn State, um, we changed our process totally. And this really works for if you're trying to get uh, uh, veterans to take to have services that's offered at your institution. One of the things that we looked at was our old process. Um, in our old process, what would happen is a veteran would disclose to their advisor. Uh, the advisor would say, okay, you contact Terry, and that's where it ended. And again, those what was happening was that they were not they were not telling me anything. So we, George and I, and another one of our colleagues, Todd, we looked at our our process and we said, okay, we need to change this to sort of accommodate how uh, meet the veterans is halfway. So we still had the disclosure phase when they disclosed. However, we added a coaching piece, and really that's the unique part of it is that the uh, the person that the veteran built a relationship with. Can, they can explain to them exactly what this new culture is going to be. Um, and again, George does a really good job in doing that because when they 
do finally contact me or I contact them, they know exactly what to expect. They know what kind of documentation I might be asking for. They know uh, that I'm, I will work with the VA for them if that if needs to be. So it's really about looking at your institution to see how can you change it to meet the veteran culture. Um, so I am going to uh, pass it back off. Oh. And I, I want to uh, thank you, Terry, for those for those ideas. I, when I said tag team with you two, I really, <laughs> I'm serious. It's a great team effort, and I think that sometimes, you know, we have to do things in teams. And George, you you were you got cut off technology. The technology failed when you were talking, but we got a really good question in related to what you do that I'd like to ask you to address. Rosemary Kelly is asking, how are coaches trained? I'm a you may be the only coach, I don't know, but how did you uh, develop the skills or get trained, or how did this all come about? Well, uh, first let me uh, thank uh, Rosemary Kelly because uh, I don't know if it's loaded or not, but she was uh, my advisor at Syracuse University for my grad program, so God, uh, I'm actually humbled. Uh, but how it worked was that I used, well, actually it's a study that, Terry and I are uh, co-investigators on, and, and we looked at uh, uh, an applied action research, and so we started looking at different things that were uh, prevalent in the, in the demographics. And one of them that keeps coming up, you always hear it, is that vets will talk to other vets. Well, I'm a vet. That made it pretty pretty straightforward. So what we do is the minute the minute somebody discloses that they may have um, some issues, or let's say you get a report back saying that this this person's having issues. For a good example, I got one uh, that that scored real well coming in, uh, but then he gives me this little hint that it's a trigger. Well, I'm doing okay in my writing, but when I take tests, I have issues. Well, I have TBI, and that's exactly what it is. And I said, well, I, I, do you? What's the issues? And then of course they told me that and these are veterans. Um, and the reason they disclosed to me is because, well, I'm a vet. So it's it's kind of sort of that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring uh, that's actually been written about in uh, uh, a lot of the uh, Makeda's uh, uh, journal pieces. And, uh, yes, I got that right. Um, so, you know, using those models and using them as a benchmark, we were able to then – uh, start looking at our processes, and, which is my forte. I, I, my background is quality systems management. And so we did the study based on uh, Lean Six Sigma and the DMAIC model. Uh, we've, we've got um, some studies that are, that are coming out to the general public. So that will actually be coming out soon. Uh, but the key importance is, is that what they'll do is the advisors, once they get these triggers, and I think I've sent out some triggers, and if not, please email me. We'll send them to you. Uh, the little buzzwords. Um, and the minute you hear that, we, we follow on with another question, basically general questions you ask normally, even today, uh, that the advisors are asking anyway. But those are triggering events that actually says, okay, well, I need to forward you on to a veteran who's going to explain to you uh, what the situation is here. And... Uh, from that point, when I get them, I basically tell them, hey, listen, uh, you're coming into a new environment. Um, you want to get command awareness. I mean, these are all words that, that veterans understand. And to gain that command awareness so that you can complete the mission. And that is you'll have to work with this person who's not a vet. So uh, don't, don't yell at him because that's happened. Don't yell at him. You know, he, he, if he asks you what you know, what's this PCS or what does TAD mean? If he, if, if he asks you, please tell him because he's actually going to help you out. So basically it's, I, I, like Terry says, what I do is I basically act as an interpreter to, uh, between one culture to the other. And uh, when that happens, it's magic. In fact, uh, I was talking to one that's actually graduating uh, next semester. It's almost unbelievable. Um, but I, I hope... Um, as far as teaching others to do that, we have uh, another person that we're actually teaching, but it's very straightforward. Uh, I know I've been asked, you know, how do I do it? I'm a one-person shop. Basically, I, I suggest, well, you have a student body of veterans. 
you know, they're looking for work study, have one come on in and learn the craft of, uh, you know, talking to people, and in particular, veterans. If you get a veteran online, hand them over to the other vet for just a few minutes. I think my average has been 17 minutes. And the minute that's done, he tells them exactly what's going to happen, sends them right back. And it's part of what uh, Jill was explaining earlier about, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And I'll tell you, veterans, if they say, hey, you really need to talk to this guy and another veteran's hearing, they'll go and talk to that guy simply because the other veteran validated. So I hope I, hope I answered uh, Rosemary's question because if not, I'm going to hear about it. <laughs> You were put on the spot a little That's bit. That's okay. There. Ken, did you have something that you wanted to uh, to contribute here? Well, actually, I just went ahead and typed it, and it kind of goes back to the, the statement I made in, a, in an answer earlier about making. How do you make people aware if you're if you're a vet if it's not on the application? We have found that vets are great recruiters, and word of mouth, believe it or not, works really well. If a vet's in a class and he sees another vet. Either he's identified himself. That right there is your great source of information exchange, and at that point, then they can refer each other for any sort of specific assistance they might need. We also um, have a, a question about uh, whether or not we have provide any um, personal counseling, in, in terms of uh, re related to therapy. Eric Rosenthal has sent that question in. Are students provided with personal counseling or long-term therapy? Um, what 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 kind of resources do do you have on your campus for that for the veterans? You no, know, that's a really good question. And um, whenever we have a veteran, especially when uh, again we, we're talking about the culture of non-disclosure, and and, and I, I use that a lot where you know. Disability and uh, is one of those things that are sensitive to talk about anyway. Um, and so during the intake, I'll actually ask those questions: Is how are they taking care of themselves? I, I give them the example quite a bit about like you can't, you know, the sort of the hierarchy of needs. And so if you're trying to complete uh, your degree or you're trying to go to, to school. Um, how how are you taking care of yourself? Online is tricky because we have students everywhere. So in a way, you have to be knowledgeable about uh, how to find resources in a, in a specific location. The great example I can give you today was that I spoke to a veteran today uh, doing an intake, and um, and they were not uh, they were actually um, not aware of some of the resources that was currently in the state. So I explained to them after the intake what I would typically do is type in a zip code and see how can I find. Um, uh, different resources in the area, may if, if it be sort of like uh, uh, some from vocational rehab or just general counseling, um, because that's really important. Is providing academic adjustments is one thing, but actually providing services is something totally different. So, and at the University of Good point. at the University of Arkansas, we Go have a, a very large. Uh, for uh, our University of Our Size Counseling and Psychological Services um, Center. And two of the individuals who were on part of the task force um, are employees there. And so we have two people, uh, one is a psychologist and one is a counselor um, who work with vets and, and work to help manage the um, and oversee other students who work with them as well. So we definitely try to get our vets in um, as, as much as we can and if not to refer them out to um, a center that we have. It's called the Vet, Res or the vet Center, uh, which is not associated with the, the VA locally here, but provides counseling that can be mental health counseling that does not then go into their file. So, I, I think maybe the takeaway message for this particular question is that that someone needs to reach out at each campus and, and put together the, the POCs, the points of contact that you need to be able to deal and, and work well with this particular student population. And some campuses have already done it or begun to do it, and some are just in the early stages. But it's not just your campus community, but your local community that has resources available to veterans, too, and you, you really need to, to broaden the scope and think big picture uh, for working with these students. We had a lot of really great questions.
uh, during at the during throughout and even coming in now for this presentation. Um, I think this presentation is kind of like an iceberg, and we're really just hit the tip of it, and there's a lot down here that it, it, that still needs to be discussed. And so, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe there will be another webcast on this topic again where we can get even more into uh, detail and maybe some case studies. Uh, but for now, I'm going to say that we have answered a lot of the questions the panelists have while the presentation was going on, but we will go through these questions after the presentation is over and, and get back to any of you. Uh, uh, if we have some specific answers and ideas and uh, to address the questions that you have. So I'm going to take uh, some time here to, to just say thank you to our panelists. Uh, amazing uh, amount of experience and dedication to the important work with our veterans here. And I, I'm just really thrilled that we all had a chance to get some uh, ideas from all of you. Um, I'd also like to thank the chair of the uh, NACADA Advising Veterans, Military Students, and Family Interest Group, Lisa Keenan. Um, what this, having this panel uh, discussion was one of her ideas as chair of that uh, interest group. And and also Rebecca Kofer, who's chair of the Advising Students with Disabilities Commission, uh, because of working with, with veterans with disabilities, this was an interest of her uh, commission as well. So we want to thank them for their support and sponsorship of this webcast. And last but certainly not least, we want to really thank all of you out there uh, who participated and uh, joined us today. We hope that you will find at least one takeaway that you'll be able to put into practice to, to serve this wonderful student population, our veterans. Thank you.